Hallelujah. God is good all the time. God is good. Praise God. It's great to be able to share God's word with you tonight. And um, I'd like you to turn with me to the Old Testament, to the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 36. It's uh, quite a, a, a long reading, but we've got to read it because it's got the whole story of what I want to sh share with you. Jeremiah, uh, chapter 36. Um, when I was preparing this, uh, I prepared it before Ian started his message last week. And I couldn't believe some of the things he said were really what I was just thinking about as we were preparing this message. So the Holy Spirit is wonderful, isn't he? Or well, four, you think, so anyway. The Holy Spirit is wonderful, how he guides and directs and puts things together. So this is Jeremiah 36. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of Je Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Take a scroll of a book and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel, against Judah, and against all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah even to this day. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the adversities which I purpose to bring upon them, that everyone may turn from his evil way, that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. And Jeremiah called Barak the son of Uriah, and Barak wrote on the scroll of a book at the instruction of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord which he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah commanded Barak, saying, I am confined. I cannot go into the house of the Lord. You go, therefore, and read from the scroll which you have written at my instruction. The words of the Lord in the hearing of the people in the Lord's house on the day of fasting. And you shall also read them in the hearing of all Judah who come from their cities. It may be that they will present their supplication before the Lord. And everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and the fury that the Lord has pronounced against this people. And Barak, the son of Neriah, did according to all that Jeremiah, the prophet, commanded him. Reading from the book the words of the Lord in the Lord's house. Now it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaimed a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem, and to all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem. Then Barak read from the book the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Jeremiah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, in the hearing of all the people. When Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of the Lord from the book, he then went down to the king's house, into the scribe's chamber, and there all the princes were sitting, Elishama, the scribe, Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, the son of Ananiah, and all the princes. Then Micaiah delivered to them all the words that he had heard when Barak read the book in the hearing of the people. Therefore all the princes sent Jehudai, the son of Nethaniah, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushai, to Barak, saying, Take to your hand the scroll from which you have read in the hearing of the people, and come. So Barak, the son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand, and came to them. And they said to him, Sit down now and read it in our hearing. So Barak read it in their hearing. Now it happened when they had heard all the words that they looked, they looked in fear from one to another and said to Barak, We will surely tell the king all the, of all these words. And they asked Barak, saying, tell us, how, tell us now, how did you write all these words at his instruction? So Barak answered them, He proclaimed with his mouth all these words to me, and I wrote them with ink in the book. Then the princess said to Barak, Go and hide, you and Jeremiah, and let no one know where you are. And they went to the king into the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elishama the scribe, and told all the words in the hearing of the king. So the king sent Jehudai to bring the scroll. 
And he took it from Elishama, the scribe's chamber. And Judah read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning on the hearth before him. And it happened when Jehudai had read three or four columns that the king cut it with a scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. Yet they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments, the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words. Nevertheless, Elnathan, Deleah, and Gemariah implored the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not listen to them. And the king commanded Jehomiel, the king's son, Sariah, the son of Azrael, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdiel, to seize Baruch the scribe and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord hid them. Now after the king had burned the scroll with the words which Baruch had written, at the instruction of Jeremiah, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Take yet another scroll, and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, has burned. And you shall say to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Thus says the Lord, You have burned this scroll, saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land, and cause man and beast to cease from here? Therefore thus says the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, he shall have no one to sit on the throne of David, and his dead body shall be cast out to the heat of the day and the frost of the night. I will punish him, his family and his servants for their iniquity. And I will bring on them, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem and on the men of Judah, all the doom that I have pronounced against them. But they did not heed. Then Jeremiah took another scroll, and gave it to Barak, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it, at the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the book which Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire. And besides, there were added to them many similar words. Father, we thank you for this wonderful word. You said that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us, Lord. We believe this word is profitable for us tonight, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, you'll give me the right words to speak. You'll guide me in sharing this word. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit will take these words and may they burn deep into the heart of everyone, Lord. Lord, bless your word to your na- for your name's sake, I ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message is, God will have the last word. God will have the last word. I've got four points. Uh, The last one is only short. But most Christians have a great deal of respect for the Bible. They profess to believe that it is God's inspired and infallible revelation of himself and his will for mankind. They're willing to listen to sermons on it. They watch videos on it. They even read books about it, especially today, books on prophecy. And yet, people do not study the Bible themselves. They know some scriptures, but there are parts of the Bible that they're completely ignorant of. You know, I'd never heard a message preached on this this passage before. I thought, well, I've never heard anything about this before. And yet the Lord led me to this. So we're going to look at the story of a king who treated the word of God with extreme contempt. He not only refused to obey its teachings, but he tried to destroy it. What was the result? The result was the word of God remained. It was enlarged. It was even more powerful than ever. And the king, together with his nation, met a sorry fate. Many organizations like uh, the Bible societies, the Gideons, uh, Pocket Testament League, uh, Wycliffe Bible Translators. Their goal is the distribution of the Bible to every living human being. That's what the goal is. They've been working this for many years. But yet there are so many people who yet don't possess a Bible. And it's going to take some time, I believe, until that goal is reached, especially with the population increasing. Since the knowledge of Scripture brings light to minds that are darkened with sin, and it is often the first step towards salvation, 
making the scriptures available to all people has been main, one of the main objectives of God's people. Also, the Bible is a very important factor in the spiritual growth of a believer. For both the saved and the unsaved, the word of God is a necessity. And that's what Ian was speaking about, the word of God coming from the mouth of God. And Jeremiah 36 deals with the writing, proclamation, and preservation of the word of God. Three aspects of which all of us should be very interested in. So the first point is a scroll is written. A scroll is written. It's been estimated that the period of time so far involved in Jeremiah's prophecies had extended for about 25 years. And words which Jeremiah was to put in written form included the substance of chapters 1 to 35 of his book. Since the scroll was apparently read through three times in a single day, now just think about that, we just read a long chapter tonight, but this scroll of, of uh, Jeremiah was thread, read three times a day, all the way through. We don't know how long it was, it's full scroll, we don't know, but it must be quite long. And some people think, though, that the historical parts were added at a later date. But without being written down, it wasn't clear how long the warnings and promises will be faithfully and accurately transmitted by word of mouth. Once they were written, though, it was more reasonable to expect they were going to be preserved. Because the Bible is so readily available today, no person needs to be in any doubt about how to become a Christian. It's all in here. Anyone wants to know how you can become a Christian, it is in this book. If anyone knows how to, wants to know how to live a holy life, it's all in this book. How to live a holy life. If you want to know how to live pleasing to God, it's all in this book. It's all there for you to read, if you read it. If you want to know the purpose of God for this world, what's happening in the Middle East today, it's all in this book. But you've got to read it to find out it's there. Ignorance in spiritual matters is usually due to willfulness, not to lack of access of the truth. You can go into most bookshops, even secular bookshops, and pick up a Bible. They are readily available in our country anyway. But it's important to notice that the scroll that the Lord told Jeremiah to produce was to contain not the words that the prophet had spoken, but the words that God had given him, like Ian said, the words that come from the mouth of God. That's what the words were. The message originated with God. He had told Jeremiah what to say, and Jeremiah had faithfully and accurately spoken the Lord's words to the people. Now he was told he had to write those words on a scroll. Nearly 25 years had passed since the prophet had started to deliver, deliver God's message to the people. How could he remember what he had said 17, 20, even 22 years earlier? How could he remember it? No problem. Just as Jeremiah had originally spoken as he had been moved by the Holy Spirit, because that's what the Bible said. Holy men of God wrote this word as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. So there was no problem. The Holy Spirit could sin, give him the same words he'd given him before. He'd now dictated it in the same manner, moved by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who'd originally inspired his words, was able to remind him of what he had said. And so he could commit God's words, God's message now, in a written form. And in verse 3 it says, Maybe, maybe the people, maybe. It's interesting that that word, maybe. The mere existence of a scroll will guarantee nothing. The presence of a Bible by no means indicates it's having an influence on the person who owns it. You might have a Bible. Many people have Bibles in the home. I had one in my home for many years on a shelf. It was given to us as a wedding present, never opened. And just ha having a Bible 
doesn't mean it's going to have an influence on a person's life. The Bible lies on a shelf. The Bible is put on a living room table. It's bringing no blessing to its owners. Only when the Bible is read does it bring God's truth to those who need it. Only as we obey God's word will it change lives by bringing them into and keeping them in that vital relationship with the Lord. That's, if you want a vital relationship with the Lord, you need to read this word. This will help you to keep that vital relationship between you and God the Father. God's purpose in having Jeremiah commit his predictions to writing was so that the people of Judah might listen to them and repent of their evil ways. So there may be here, it doesn't mean that God wasn't aware in advance that the re repeated warnings would be rejected. Of course he knew that. But God wanted to give his people another chance. And it says the scroll was to be written against the people of Judah and of Israel and of all the nations. But what was its purpose? Its purpose was for their good. Why? That they might repent and receive forgiveness. This word has been written that you might repent and receive forgiveness. Even tonight, forgiveness. People who think that the word of God in the Old Testament, the God of the Old Testament was harsh and vindictive, overlook the wonderful truth that the warnings and promises of judgment were given in love. It was not God's desire that people should suffer for their sins. He wanted them to forsake their wickedness as he does today. He wants people to turn to him and to live. That's the whole purpose of the word of God. Some preachers, you'll, you'll find them on, on the internet, seem to have a same satisfaction preaching about the torments of hell. When such preaching is loveless and vindictive, as it frequently is, it accomplishes nothing. Some preachers only preach about the love of God. That's all you hear from some preachers. God is a God of love. There needs to be a balance. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of judgment. Warnings given in loving compassion can be greatly moving. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. Why? Because of the tears he shed over the sins of his people. Do you ever shed tears over the sins of the world of the people today? Jeremiah did. There are times God will move upon you so much that you will weep for the sins of our nation. What, who was it in Scotland? He said, Give me Scotland or I die. Wept, wept over Scotland. Oh, Jeremiah, he wept for the sins of the people. He delivered God's warnings with a heart full of tender compassion. And you know, such concern is the proper motive for all sorts of warnings. When you're driving, you'll come and it'll say, sharp bend, or it'll say bridge closed, or it'll say railway crossing, and so on. As you drive, we see all sorts of warning signs. What are the purpose of those warnings? to help those in danger to escape painful consequences. That is also true in the spiritual sense. These warnings are given to avoid painful consequences. Jeremiah had already given these warnings verbally, but now he had to put them in written form so the people would have another opportunity to heed them and repent. The Bible clearly teaches that people will have no second chance after death. Let me tell you, friends, if you die without Christ, you will not have another chance. You have no second chances after death. But it also clearly teaches in this life, God not only gives a second chance, but a third, a fourth, a fifth, and so on. Praise God he does. What a mighty God, a loving God we have. He gives chance after chance, many chances to heed people while they are still alive. Every Gideon Bible in a hotel room, every evangelistic message on television or radio, 
Every tract is another opportunity for a person to make peace with God. Do you carry tracts with you? Do you carry John's Gospels with you? You'd be amazed how many people have been saved when they've read a John's Gospel. A lot of people are using them today. I'm glad my cousin, who, who became a Christian some years ago down in Sussex, she just ordered a great number of John's Gospels to give her. So I'm so thankful about that. And just uh, on Friday, we went for a little walk uh, down near Latham, and we called a little pub to have some lunch. There was only myself and Norma in the room, and a couple walked in that same room. And I, I had my back to them, and I heard Norma say, I like your T-shirt. And when I looked, uh, the lady had a T-shirt that said, Jesus is coming again. And the man had a T-shirt and said, Jesus came as a lamb first time, next time he'll come as a lion. So when we were paying the bill, we were together, and I said to the waitress, what do you think about this T-shirt? And she was really interested. Anyway, we shared with her, and as, before we left, we gave her John's Gospel. She said she would read that Gospel. Please pray for her. Her name is Nicole. So it's important that we give out the word of God, because it's another opportunity for a person to make peace with God. Some people believe the words of the Bible were dictated by God, and the human writers put them down on parchment, like a secretary writes a letter dictated by a boss. Others believe the Holy Spirit inspired the writers, but left them free to write their message in their own words of their own. Perhaps both views are inspiration, may be correct to some extent. But he it was Jeremiah, not the Lord, who did the dictating. But the words that Jeremiah dictated were, it says, the words of the Lord, which he had spoken to him. All scriptures said before is given by inspiration of God. Every word in this Bible is there because God wants it there. Every word, God wants it there. The scroll was read in the temple, but for some reason Jeremiah was unable to go there into the temple. Perhaps he'd been banned from the temple because of his unpatriotic messages, predicting that Judah was going to be conquered by the armies of Babylon. So instead, Jeremiah sent Barak to do the reading. Most of us are unable, for some reasons, to personally to take God's word to people far from where we live, but you can have a share in it. You can share financially as you give to those who are doing outreach. You can pray for those who are doing outreach, who are going out with the message of life to other places. And we're told that Barak obeyed the prophet's instructions. So the scroll was written. The second point, the scroll was read. The scroll was read. It was thought that Jeremiah sent Barak to read the scroll so that those who heard it would be more inclined to pay attention to the message rather than to the messenger. Jeremiah, because of his gloomy and pessimistic predictions, he got a dubious reputation. If Jeremiah stood up to read, it's possible that just because of his presence, it would have incensed the people even before he'd spoken a word because... They recognized what sort of a man he was. And you know, it's possible for a Christian to get the kind of reputation that robs his spoken testimony of all value. A man who drives a hard big bargain in business, a Christian. One who loses his temper. One who is unfriendly to strangers in church. You'll find that his testimony is not very good as a Christian. It is not of any great value. You know, actually, we might be unfair to a person if we prejudge what he says by his reputation. For often a person does not deserve the poor representation he gets by someone's misrepresentation or ignorance. Also, sometimes we wrong a person because we do not like his disposition or his personality. The Apostle Paul was a great writer, but by reputation... His personal appearance was unimpressive. His speech was contemptible, the Bible says. Also, an unpopular person may often be speaking the truth. Even Balaam's ass spoke the truth. 
If a person has a winsome personality, if he's sincere and enthusiastic, if he has the gift of the gab, many of his listeners will swallow almost anything he has to say. We see that with many of these American TV preachers. Many people swallow the things they say. We're neither to commend or to condemn a message because of the messenger's looks, personality, voice, gestures, clothes, or even sincerity. The basis for our reception of a message is whether or not it is true to scripture. The Christians in Berea judge the apostle Paul by this standard. Let's just have a look in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. You see what the people, the Christians in Berea did with the apostle Paul. Acts 17, verse 11. These were firm-minded than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. They tested the scriptures of what Paul was saying. Of course, a person cannot judge a message by scripture unless there's some knowledge of the Bible. So many people even in Christian churches, are taken in by all kinds of errors, especially today by the teaching of liberalism, replacement theology that says God's finished with Israel, that the church has replaced Israel. That is a lie, but that is being preached and many people are being taken in by it and don't support Israel today. They boycott Israel, again, because of the wrong teaching. The prosperity gospel. Tell the name it, claim it, and frame it. Or blob it, grab it. This thing. How false that is today. I believe the prosperity God wants it. We have enough to live on, enough to give away. But not the way the, the preachers are telling whether God. Someone came to me one day in America and said, Oh, God just told me he's going to give you an aeroplane. So oh, that'd be wonderful. Oh, how false you can get, you know. And one of the big ones today, the New Apostolic Reformation. Some people have never heard of it. You go on and Google, look at it. New Apostolic Reformation. It's almost saying that we are going to present the world ready for when Christ comes back. And you look at the state of the world today, not a good, good job about it. No. The Bereans search the scriptures daily in order to check on Paul's preaching. For Christians today, even in Christian churches, people need to do that, need to check the truth. Baruch followed Jeremiah's instructions and read the scroll to all the people who would listen. Micaiah was a grandson of Shaphan, the scribe who supported the reforms made in Judah 10 or 15 years earlier by King Josiah. Micaiah's father, Gamariah, was one of the officials to whom Micaiah carried his report of the reading of the scroll. And Micaiah realized when he heard Baruch reading the word of God to the crowds at the temple, that this event was important enough to be reported to the officials or the princes who were in their office at the temple. And he went to them promptly. The princes were very impressed. They sent Jehudi to get Baruch to come with a scroll. Barak came straight away with a scroll in his hand. It doesn't say that Barak gave the princes any details of what was written in the scroll. He simply read to them the words that Jeremiah had dictated to him. The words that God had first spoken to Jeremiah, which he'd been proclaiming in and around Jerusalem for the more than 20 years. The princes were apparently open to the message of the scroll, for the reading, it says, filled them with fear. They recognized that the message was so important they should go and tell the king about it. It doesn't say whether they believe the message or not, or what the, they thought the king would do in response to it. They simply felt that their duty was to give the, give the king the prophet's warning so he could take steps to preserve the nation from impending disaster if he chose to do so. Or he could ignore the warning, if that's what he decided. 
They didn't expect the king to be happy about the situation. So they advised Jeremiah to go and hide himself. Go and hide somewhere with Barak. The effect of the reading on the princes shows how the word of God is living and powerful. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Piercing to the dividing of soul and spirit and the bone and marrow. The word of God is powerful. This word is powerful, friends. You own power in your hand when you have this Bible. The princes wanted to know how the scroll would come into being. It didn't look like the princes responded to the scroll personally, but they did seem to recognize it as a divine revelation. One second. So, that's the second point. The scroll was written, the scroll was read. The third point, the scroll was burned. The scroll was burned. In verse 20 and 11, verse 11, the expression, all the words, doesn't mean that Micaiah and the princes repeated word for word from memory every sentence that Jeremiah had dictated to Barak. They give a summary of the message that was written on the scroll. The king was sitting in his winter house. It was the ninth month, November the 15th to December the 15th. The weather was chilly. There was a fire in the hearth in front of him to keep him comfortable. The king sent Jehudai to bring the scroll, not because he wanted to know God's will more completely. Jehudai began reading the scroll. And every time Jehudai had read three or four columns, the king would stop him, slice it off with a penknife, and throw those columns into the fire. He did that until all the scroll had been burned. The king wasn't interested in learning what was on the scroll. He wasn't looking for the truth of God's revelation. What he wanted to do and what he did was to show his complete contempt for the scroll, its message, the prophet, and God himself. His attitude is an illustration of how the carnal mind is at enmity with God. His conduct is in such a contrast with the way King Josiah responded to the reading of the long lost scrolls. Just look at 2 Chronicles 34 and see how King Josiah responded. We'll find it. 2 Chronicles chapter 34, verse 29 to 33. Sorry, my pages are sticking together. Then the king went and gathered all the elders of Judah in Jerusalem. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the Levites and all the people, great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Then the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. And he made all who were present in Jerusalem and Benjamin to take a stand. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem did a call into the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel and made all who were present in Israel diligently to serve the Lord their God. What a difference. What a different king Josiah was to Jehoiakim. Three of the princes, including Gemariah, did their best to try and convince the king he was making a grave mistake by burning the scroll. But he didn't pay any attention Jeremiah's message should have led them to tear their garments, but it didn't bother him. The king sent his son and some other men to seize Jeremiah and Barak. He probably wanted to imprison them. Jehoiakim hated the message. He probably hoped it was untrue. But in his heart, he must have suspected the truth of the message. If he thought that Jeremiah was simply a ranting fanatic, he might have been less disturbed. He decided to get rid of God's message by imprisoning or even executing God's messenger. 
I read a story of a man called Elisha, not uh, the Elisha of the Bible, who was a captain of a ship that years ago took tourists fishing off the coast of Maine in the USA. On one occasion, a heavy fog came up. Elisha's helper was steering by compass, but the captain's sense of direction indicated that the compass was in error. The two men argued until Elisha threw the compass overboard and pointed in what he supposed was the direction of land. Late that evening, they landed some 30 miles from their destination, thankful that they had not ended up far out at sea. In destroying the scroll, the king was throwing the compass overboard, and liberals often do the same thing, because they do not like the teaching of Scripture, or because they disagree with it, they reject it. Friends, I want to tell you, you can't get rid of the truth by saying it isn't so. It's impossible to invalidate the teachings of the Bible by throwing the Bible away. We might not agree with the compass, but I want to tell you the compass has a way of being right. As for Jeremiah and Barak, the king couldn't harm them because the Lord had hidden them, safe from the wrath of Jehoiakim. So the scroll was written, the scroll was read, the scroll was burned, but finally, and it's only short, the scroll was rewritten. Throwing a Gideon Bible out of a window at a hotel room might relieve someone's irritation. Burning a Bible might bring pleasure to some people, like I think it was uh, Andrew who shared last week in the prayer meeting, someone burying a cart full of Bibles. Is that right, Andrew? It might bring some pleasure to people doing that. Hiding a Bible in the attic or in the bottom drawer of a drawer. It doesn't change the demands that God makes on us. You can burn the Bible. You can throw it away. But the word of God stands forever. Amen. The king of Judah got nowhere by burning the scroll. The Lord simply told Jeremiah to rewrite the message, adding to it additional things of a condemnatory nature. And the king and his people were in a worse state than ever before. So don't throw the Bible away. Only three of the princes, so much as dared to suggest that the king should not burn the scroll containing God's word. Not a single one of them even remotely hinted that the right course of action was to respond to God's warnings in repentance and to accept his promises in faith. People have been cutting out People have been burning portions of scripture for many years. They say the story of Jonah is a fable. They say the creation, story of creation is a myth. They say the miracles are fictitious. I remember someone saying that uh, they were preaching about the, the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea. And uh, someone said, that it's impossible that when they crossed, they, there was only six inches of water or something and someone shouted hallelujah and they said why are you shouting hallelujah so well god drowned them all in six inches of water <laughs> they said the virgin birth is a myth they said the resurrection is impossible many christians however who would never dream of burning or disbelieving god's word come far short of responding to it as they ought to do. They profess to believe it, but listen, the way they live their lives gives a lie to their profession. They're no more holy or spiritual than people who no, make no profession of faith. To burn the Bible is wicked, but to ignore its teachings is equally sinful. I finish with this scripture, just listen to this. John 12, 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Friends, you can burn the Bible, you can throw it away, but this Bible will be there to judge you when you stand before the Lord. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will no way pass away. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever.
How will you be judged by the word of God? When God says, Jesus said, you must be born again. Unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. How will you respond when you stand before God? Will God say, yes, I know that you've been born again. If you're not born again, you will go to hell. It's as clear as that. It's appointed to man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. How will you respond to God's word? How will you respond to when God says that Jesus came and died on a cross in your place and shed his precious blood to wash your sins away? And if you trust in that, you can be forgiven. How will you respond if you've never received Jesus Christ into your heart and life as your Savior? How are you going to, as it says in the Bible, repent? Have you repented of your sins? The Bible says you must repent and be born again. He says repent and be baptized. How many of you have not obeyed him by being, not being baptized? He says repent and be baptized, every one of you. There's a baptism pool there. If you've not been baptized, it's a command. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Have you been filled with the Spirit? The Bible says be filled with the Spirit. The Bible will judge you in the last day. Have you been saved? Have you been baptized? Have you been filled with the Spirit? There's so much more I could say, but I just want to leave it at that. I just challenge you tonight. If you are not born again tonight, you can come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I'll finish here. One more scripture I'll finish with. You know, it says, He who covers his sins and will, will not prosper, but he who forsakes them shall have mercy. But I want to just finish with Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Romans 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the, house, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And so... You can be saved. You've got to believe in your heart that Jesus died for you. You've got to receive him into your life. And then you've got to confess it with your mouth. If you do that, when you stand before God, you will not be condemned. He will say, enter into my kingdom. Tonight, I give you that opportunity. If you've never been saved, you've never repented of your sin tonight, I challenge you, make sure you get right with God because you never know, tomorrow. you might not be here tomorrow. God never promises you another breath. Every breath is a gift from God. Make sure tonight before you leave this place, come and speak to me and get right with God. Receive Jesus into your heart so when you stand before him, you will not be ashamed. Amen. We're going to finish with a hymn. I was going to read something else, but I'll leave it. Time's